Hi, everybody. Come on, it's not, this is the way to spend a Sunday, is it not? I have to tell you, I was peeking in on your workout. You guys were pretty frigging impressive. It was crazy. So welcome. We're so happy you're spending your Sunday with us. Before we get started, we have a very special message from one of our favorite people. Take a look. Hello, New York. Thanks so much for coming out today for Move for Minds. We're so excited that you've come to Equinox. Hi, everybody from Equinox, and thanks so much for being such a great partner with Move for Minds. This is our second year. We're bigger and better than ever, and that's because all of you who went out and raised money, who are making time to be in the club today to exercise, get educated, get engaged in this fight to wipe out Alzheimer's. As you may know, and you're gonna hear today, every 66 seconds, a new brain develops Alzheimer's. Two thirds of them are women. Why is that? Nobody knows, but you're helping us find out why, because you're funding research, and most important, I think, is you're gonna change how you live your life after what you learned today. So I wanna thank you so much for being a part of Move for Minds, for being in the women's Alzheimer's movement. What we're asking you to do is when you leave here today, tell one other person what you learned and how they can live a more brain healthy and more physically healthy lifestyle. Once again, thanks so much and have a great day, New York. Don't you love Maria Shriver? Absolutely love her. I want our panel to introduce themselves, each person, and we're gonna have a great discussion. So why don't we start here with you, Dr. Suzuki. So my name is Wendy Suzuki. I'm a professor of neuroscience and psychology at New York University. And my lab studies how physical aerobic exercise can change your brain. And I'm here because it's a whole event about how <laughs> exercise can change your brain. All right. My name is Max Lugavere. I am a filmmaker. I'm working on a documentary, which is the first ever uh, film to document the burgeoning science of dementia prevention, which is very important to me. Um, I became engaged in this topic when my mom developed dementia. I also have a book coming out next year, which is sort of like a deep dive into how nutrition affects the brain, which is my passion. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Richard Isaacson. Is this thing on? Hang on. Okay. Max, One more time. Help a brother out. Thank you. <laughs> um, my name is Richard Isaacson. I'm a neurologist, a brain doctor. Um, I started the first Alzheimer's prevention clinic in the United States several years ago. Okay, you just heard the term Alzheimer's and prevention in the same sentence. That means we're making progress, but we can't prevent Alzheimer's just yet. Okay, there's no magic pill, there's no magic bullet, but we're learning and we're starting today. And we're every, every day we're making progress. This Alzheimer's prevention clinic between last year's Move for Minds and this year's Move for Minds spread to Puerto Rico because as you heard earlier, um, Alzheimer's disease affects underrepresented minorities more, okay? African Americans, Latinos, twice the rate, okay? So we need to figure this out and we need to get people involved and uh, it's a really super pleasure to be here. Hello, my name is Anna Fidelia Tavares. I'm a physician by training and I've been working in public health. I'm the director of programs at the Alzheimer's Association and we're the largest voluntary health organization that's devoted to helping people with Alzheimer's. So we advocate for uh, people with dementia and their caregivers. We fund Alzheimer's research and we provide services to people in the community. And the, reason why I'm so excited to be here is to let people know that there are services to help them. Um, all our services are, are free, and we don't want people to suffer alone. We want people to be focused on early detection, um, make sure that their family members, if they're showing signs of Alzheimer's disease, get the help that they need so that they, they can um, plan for the future, get a care team together, and participate in clinical trials, because we know that that's how we're gonna get to a cure and we're get really going to move the needle for Alzheimer's and everybody who's affected. Um, hi, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, my name is Jay Newton-Small and I'm CEO and co-founder of Memory Well. I'm also a longtime Time Magazine correspondent and MSNBC contributor. Um, I'm here as part of Memory Well. We're a network of more than 300 journalists across the country telling the life stories of those living with Alzheimer's and dementia in order to help improve their care. That grew out of my experience with my father. I was his primary caregiver, um, and he passed last year after a 15-year struggle with Alzheimer's, and I put him into a home a few years ago. They asked me to fill out like a 20-page questionnaire about his life, and I'm like, who remembers 20 pages of handwritten data points for the 150 residents here? No one, right? 
I'm a journalist, let me just write down a story for you. I did, and it completely transformed his care. And so we're trying to replicate that across the country for everybody uh, living with the disease. All right, Dr. Isaacson, we'll, we'll start with you, because Maria just, of course, made the point of the number of women, disproportionate number of women who are getting this. Last year we had this conversation. It's been 365 days. What do we know now that we didn't know then about why women seem to get it more rapidly than men? So, uh, can, okay, you guys can all hear me. So I think we've made a little bit of progress in that time because first of all, um, there's been a little bit more of a push in terms of the research and um, at least the projects have been started. I'm not gonna say we have all the answers yet. I think it's several fold. You know, in the past, people used to say, well, women live longer than men, so maybe that's why. But I'm not sure that's exactly the case. Um, for example, hormones, okay? Women over the menopause, okay, have a hormonal transition. And depending on different women with different hormones in different metabolic states, certain people may need hormone replacement, maybe other women don't. Maybe some women should be on hormone replacement for five to 10 years and that's about it. But maybe other women past the age of 60 who have metabolic problems, maybe they preferentially respond or don't respond to hormones. Now, this is, this is complicated, that sounded complicated, right? It was supposed to because there is no one-size-fits-all approach to Alzheimer's disease treatment or prevention. That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. And this is a field called precision medicine, where we treat each person as an individual. So I'm gonna answer your question with where, th where the field is going. And the field is going towards learning about an individual person, learning about their hormonal signatures, their individual biology, their genetics, just like we're doing in cancer. Precision medicine and Alzheimer's will figure out which woman needs to be on what, and maybe why they may be on the express road, to Alzheimer's disease or in the express lane, but a man, maybe he, he, he may be sitting in traffic on the road to Alzheimer's. Well, talk about genetics, because I have friends whose parents have Alzheimer's, and they are scared every day, every time they forget something, or they wonder, is that, is that my destiny? Me, destiny? Am I predestined to get Alzheimer's? What's the answer to that? Genes are not your destiny, okay? You heard it here first, okay? If you have the most common gene for Alzheimer's, okay? If you have, if, if I have four family members with Alzheimer's disease, I get it, okay? If you have that gene, lifestyle interventions, exercise, healthy eating, and cognitive engagement, those interventions preferentially work if you have that most common gene for Alzheimer's disease, okay? Genes are not your destiny. However, yeah. early onset cases, this is a little different. 6%, only six, but still it's a lot. 6% of cases of Alzheimer's, if you have the gene, you get the disease. Okay, that's a different disease, same Alzheimer's, different type of disease. But common things happen commonly. If you have that gene, you can win the tug of war against your gene. All right, let's talk working out because we've spent the day doing that. And you always wonder what is it, and we'll, I'll ask you, Wendy, about working out. What happens to your brain when you are working out that somehow helps it? Yeah, so let me just start with two main findings that we know. First of all, does everybody feel good right now? You feel good from this workout? Yes. And so I can tell you that is because physical aerobic activity will up the levels of at least three neurotransmitters important for mood, dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline. So that's what's happening in your brain right now. But long-term increases in exercise, um, what it's doing immediately is actually, we know that it's secreting different hormones and, uh, from your muscles and uh, ketone bodies from your liver when you work out. Those things are passing through your blood-brain barrier and they're stimulating the release of a very important growth factor in your brain called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. All you need to know is that that growth factor is helping both your prefrontal cortex, important for attention, as well as a key structure for long-term memory called the hippocampus. So the more you exercise, the more you're going to be stimulating this really important growth factor in your brain. So Wendy, let me ask you this. If yeah. you were asked, I yeah. want to do one exercise that yeah. I know is the best exercise for my brain, yeah. what would be the one that you would choose? Uh, from the research, it's clearly aerobic. You have to do anything that's increasing your heart rate, okay? So what about walking? Walking, so walking is great because that will give you the mood boost. It may not increase the BDNF, uh, which, is, your, uh, which yeah. is the thing that is going to increase size and, and stimulate birth of new neurons mm -hmm. in this key structure called the hippocampus. So to get that uh, benefit, you're going to have to increase your aerobic exercise, just like you guys did. So mm -hmm. take your choice, but make sure your heart is increasing, your heart rate is increasing. Max, we're talking about how it's, it's not genetics, like you were not predisposed. You said you have four family members. 
No, I have, or, I, well, I have one. One. Richard over oh, here Richard has four. four. But, I, one. but yes, my mom uh, a couple years ago developed uh, Your mom has memory it. loss. Yeah. Was this w how and why you got involved? Because when I look at out, I see a lot of young people, and I'm, I'm wondering, do they have parents? Um, are they just active in, in, in the field? So what was it for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I love Maria's work, and I came about her because of the, the, the massive effort that she makes to, you know, help people understand that Alzheimer's is really kind of a caregiver's disease as well. You know, it's, it's something that uh, young people, she calls, I think, the caregivers on deck. Um, but I saw, a very, I had a very visceral sort of revelation when I was in the clinic with my mom, and I started doing my own research, and I realized that changes begin in the brain decades before the first Alzheimer's symptom. With some biomarkers, meaning things that they can measure uh, on brain scans, visible in the brains of 20-year-olds that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. So if you subtract 30, let's just be conservative and say 30, from my mom's age at the time when I first started taking her to neurologist's office, I was like, wow, that's me. And so I became really, really passionate about doing my own research and becoming an expert in my own health so that I can have the best odds against this horrible category of diseases. And you do this thing about there's a correlation between your gut and your brain. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big believer in what's called the gut-brain axis. It's a very new area of focus for researchers, but uh, there seems to be this really interesting link between the health of the gut and brain health, um, in part because the gut is a major modulator of something called inflammation in the body, which is sort of like the fire of infection, which, you know, is meant to sort of spot clean wounds and stuff when we have a sprained ankle or whatever, but, you know, a lot of us eat pretty poor diets today, and that's causing this uh, reaction to occur on a global scale throughout the body, and that affects the brain. You know what's interesting? I don't know if you guys saw, but Maria was on the Today Show last this past week, and she did something on those blue zones, which are the areas where people live to be 100. They went to Costa Rica and to Greece and to all these different places, and what they found among the centenarians was there were zero cases of Alzheimer's or dementia. And she said it was like one of those things that she looked and, and tried to figure out why. And they had like, I think it was a handful of factors. One, they all had a steady diet of beans. Okay, hello. Anyway, that's one. Two, they are surrounded by family members. They had grandchildren, great-grandchildren. They were constantly in discussions and talking. Three, they, they had a lot of, there was a lot of faith. Faith was big in all of these groups. And then they all exercised. But when you watch these people and how sharp they were when it comes to that, it, it made me think, doctor, just about all the different factors that roll into having Alzheimer's. Right, and I think that's really important. You know, my work has really been about how do you translate the science and make that happen in communities um, and arm people with the information from the scientists to actually change their lives and how do we change the health of communities. And so, you know, part of my work at the Alzheimer's Association is doing just that. So we have a campaign, 10 Ways that, to Love Your Brain, which is really focused on having a healthy diet, exercising, quitting smoking if you smoke, treating you know, diabetes, hypertension, all these things that we know are linked to Alzheimer's and getting the point across that brain health equals heart health. Mm -hmm. um, social engagement is really important and we need to bring this out into the community, take it from the ivory tower to the community, to churches, to schools, so people know what Alzheimer's is, know what early detection is, recognize the signs if they see this in their love member uh, or family member and make sure that person gets health, um, but also make sure that they're making the steps today to protect their brain health. Um, and that's really critical for, for this work. We, we need to hit um, this disease at all stages from the research to the community and you um, sort of, if we really want to make a difference. Yeah, you sort of get why people might not think it really is Alzheimer's when they're talking to someone because everything in you wants you to think, no, it, they probably just forgot or it's probably nothing. I mean, just real quick, doctor, back to you. How do you know if it's something you should be concerned about if you're talking to someone who seems to be becoming forgetful or whether it's... It's, uh, you know, it's just a re the regular aging process. So, so the classic thing is if you have something on the tip of your tongue, but you remember it later, well, that's a lot more consistent with maybe aging, age-related memory loss. But when things are progressive, when you lose your keys, but, but you, you really can't find them, when you get lost while driving, when you start acting irritable or have sleep problems, Alzheimer's disease is a brain disease. It's a neuropsychiatric disease, so sleep troubles, personality changes, depression. These are all things that are a part of the constellation of symptoms. Um, I think that the most important point here is if you, if you notice a loved one is starting to have any element of change, don't be afraid. 
Don't be fearful. There's a delay of years, four years, four years on average, when a person starts developing symptoms to the eventual diagnosis of Alzheimer's. That's, that's, we can't do that. Take, get educated, get informed, see a doctor, see a specialist, have this conversation. Jay, you saw it firsthand, obviously, in your, in your own life. Why don't you just describe a little bit what it was like to be, to be you? Um, well, I first saw symptoms in my father when I was a junior in college. Um, and I was doing a junior year abroad in Paris. And my father came to visit me, and we went out and had dinner with my roommates. He took us out to dinner. At the end of dinner, he didn't remember what hotel he was staying at, which was really weird. Like, I'd never seen that before. And he had this moment of panic. Like, I, he was like, I don't know. Any, I don't think he actually knew what city he was in. And, um, and I just had this moment of just dread, like something was really, really wrong. Um, and a year later, he was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's um, at the age of 58. Um, and so he, um, for him, it was very slow and progressive. My mother was his primary caregiver for the first 10 years of the diagnosis. Um, but like 40% of all primary caregivers of those living with Alzheimer's and dementia, the stress overcame my mother. And actually, my mother died of an aneurysm associated with stress um, from caregiving for him um, 10 years after that. And I became his primary caregiver after that. Um, I'm an only child, so I was you know, 10 years out of college, and I was my dad's caregiver. And, um, and it was like a whole new experience. It was definitely like growing up very suddenly, um, you know, from being like a kid to being an adult. What did you learn? I mean, there are a lot of probably caregivers here. What, what did you learn? Um, what did you learn from that experience? Um, gosh, so many things. Um, I mean, my parents, my, my, uh, you know, my parents' marriage was so, like my mother hid my dad's diagnosis for so many years because there's so much stigma around it. And he was really the social center of their universe. And she was so afraid that they would lose friends and become isolated that she actually started learning jokes so that she could be funny, so that people would like her too. And, um, you know, so that, like, because she was afraid that he was losing it. And, um, and he, you know, he really cued on her. He followed her around all the time. They had all these sort of, like, tricks. Like, she would have signals, and he would tell a joke, or he'd flirt with a waitress, or he'd, like... And my dad was this really larger-than-life Australian personality who... But, like, he got away with basically lying to everybody by being, like, he called everybody mate. He knew nobody's name whatsoever. and be like, hey, mate, you know, and they just thought it was charming. Um, and he had, and like, muscle memory is actually really amazing. So my dad had, like, an amazing golf game. He could, like, shoot six under par for 18 holes. And none of his golf buddies realized that he had Alzheimer's because he was such a great golfer. And they never thought, like, put, you know, how could you not know my name but have this amazing golf game? Um, and so just watching them cope over the years, I think I didn't realize the full extent of how hard that was for my mom. And they were in the process of moving up to Washington so I could help take care of my dad when my mom passed. Um, and then, you know, I tried to take care of him, but he, like, was just too much. I mean, I moved him into my house, um, but I had to lock him in because he was a wanderer. And then I came home once, and um, he was used to an electric stove. My house, I had a gas stove. The house was full of gas because he tried to cook and didn't realize how to, how to work the stove. He would walk my dog, and five panic hours later, like, police and fire would find him, you know, four miles away. And finally, I had to put him, and then he started to get really aggressive, which actually is common. About 20% of those living with Alzheimer's and dementia get aggressive and violent, and, um, and I couldn't handle him anymore. And so I finally had to move him into a home. But, um, and that was also really depressing for me because I don't know if anyone's been to some of these homes, but they're super isolating, right? Like nobody knows anybody in these homes. You go there and like my dad, for example, had this best friend, this guy named Warren, and they would hang out all the time. And I knew, like I'd be like, hey Warren, what's up? And he'd be like, hey. And I'd ask his nurses, like, what's the deal with Warren? Who's Warren? And like, tell me a story. And they had no idea about who Warren was. And to a lot of these caregivers, it's just about moving them from A to B, like moving them from meal to bed to whatever. They don't know who these people are. They don't know what great life stories they have. And there's 55% on average turnover of caregivers in all these homes. So there's super amounts of churn, and you're constantly having to introduce themselves to new caregivers, and they can't. Yeah. Well, that's, that's so interesting. And you were talking, too, Doctor, about how there are underserved communities who, when you talk about the idea of hiding the idea that a loved, a loved one has, has Alzheimer's, is, is common. Right. And so African Americans are diagnosed two times the rate, Latinos one point five times the rate of um, white people. And so I think 
just across the board, the awareness is, is low, um, but certainly in communities of color, a lot of people have this um, misconception that this is just a normal part of aging, and then further have ideas about, well, we take care of our own, and so there's nothing to do, um, and so they're not seeking care. So that's a, a critical part about what we do, why we go out into communities to educate people about what's the difference between warning signs of Alzheimer's versus normal aging, and saying that these memory changes that are affecting your activities of daily living, that is not normal aging. Um, and so, you know, we have a campaign about the 10 warning signs really saying this is not normal, get help, we are here to help. So we have lots of free services available for people all across the country so that they can educate themselves on the warning signs. If they have a loved one who has Alzheimer's, they can get, um, you know, training on how to deal with mm -hmm. behavioral issues, how to deal with communication issues, how to start planning and getting their legal and financial um, plans in order, how to be hooked up to clinical trials, because we know that this is the information that people need. Um, and we can also, you know, sit down with families and come up with a care plan. So we have social workers who can sit down with families and do that free of charge and say, you know, okay, you're overwhelmed. Do you need a support group? Do you need to, um, you know, look at uh, nursing homes? We can help you assess nursing homes and give you some referrals. Do you need an elder care attorney? So we can do that. And many people just don't know about these services and they suffer in silence. And that happens with African Americans and Latinos, but really it happens with everybody because we are all affected by this disease. When you just look at the numbers, um, one out of nine people over age 65, one out of three people over age 85 will have Alzheimer's or another dementia. So this is a huge problem touching all communities and that's why we're here to get the word out and make sure that people are um, hooked up with the critical services that will actually help them. Max, let's, let's talk diet for a second because I think we all wanna be able to eat certain things that we know we're gonna, that are gonna help us as we go down the road. So since you've been studying this, what's, what do you suggest? Well, I think it's, it's hard to make a one-size-fits-all dietary approach. I think most people on the panel, especially Richard over here, would agree with me. Um, but, it, but in general, you know, the statistics are pretty staggering that uh, most Americans get the, the majority of their calories from ultra-processed foods these days, which are basically foods that are found in the aisles of a supermarket rather than on the perimeter, which is where you have the healthy foods, the natural foods, the foods that are perishable. Um, and so, you know, the diet that I eat and that I, uh, you know, implore most people to sort of embrace is a diet that's on the lower side in on the carbohydrate spectrum you know uh, for many years we've been led to eat according to a food pyramid which was designed with economic goals in mind you know and uh, that put sort of grains at the bottom of this of this food pyramid which you know does one thing very well and that's elevate your blood sugar and you know back for the vast majority of our, of our evolution things that would do that would appear in our diet seasonally and they would serve a purpose to help us store fat to get through the winter so today you know i try to tell people that they should not only be more active and exercise more which is you know incredible brain medicine uh, but eat a diet that's lower in carbohydrates and also higher in dark leafy greens. There's research showing that people that eat the most dark leafy greens mm -hmm. have brains that on scans look 11 years younger. Wow. So rather than fill up your plate with starches and grains and things like that, I implore people to eat more uh, vegetables, mm -hmm. you know, which are really rich in micronutrients that the research shows um, we're not getting enough of, that perform duties in the body ranging from DNA repair to helping us generate energy. So. Um, I try to, one really simple takeaway, I try to eat every single day a huge salad, every single day. I cover so many of my bases in this salad, it's not even funny. Kale, spinach, arugula, um, and extra virgin olive oil. It's just great. I have a blast actually doing it. You have a blast? I'm kind of a nerd Adorable. for this stuff. <laughs> what about protein? Because again, that back to Maria's piece, they, those people had mainly a plant-based diet. They got their proteins from beans and things like that. Yeah. They didn't eat lots of fish, which I thought was the way it worked. They didn't eat lots of, of any kind of protein. Yeah, well, some research suggests that one serving of fatty fish a week might be protective to the brain. I try to get two to three. I also think, and this might be a little bit more contro controversial with a little bit less evidence, but personally, I think that it's better to eat a little bit of uh, grass-fed red meat, if you eat meat, uh, than to not eat any. And I think it's better to eat a little bit than too much. You know, so I, again, try to get two to three servings of grass-fed organic red meat every day. Because, I mean, in terms of nutrient density, 
We eat, our diets today have become very energy dense, but not very nutrient dense. So when we're talking about nutrient density, which is something that I try with every meal, I try to aim for nutrient density, that's the one sort of unifying principle of my diet. Uh, you can't really beat grass-fed red meat. Mm -hmm. Highly bioavailable iron, omega-3s, less omega-6s, um, protein, of course. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's actually very interesting research from uh, Deakin University in Australia, the Food and Mood Center. Women that didn't eat the recommended amounts of uh, red meat actually were twice as likely to be depressed, which is very, very interesting. Yeah. I mean, you could argue, and I have no affiliation with any meat producer whatsoever. Just so, just so, any, just so everybody knows, and it's clear, if, you t if I found research tomorrow that, you know, that uh, counteracted this, I would, I would give up my stance. But, you know, in the animals in the United States are raised under deplorable conditions, and they're not good for you. But meat is a continuum. In Australia, they tend to get more grass-fed meat from New Zealand and what have you. And um, so they found that, you know, the recommendations there are two to three servings a week. Women that didn't eat were more likely to be depressed, and women that ate more than that were also more likely to be depressed. So there seems to be this narrow window where a little bit is good for you. Okay, all right. If, when, if you were gonna give a good workout regimen, or just, yeah. I know that everybody's different in this room, but yeah. sometimes, I don't know about you guys, but I wander in the gym, I look around, I pick a weight up, I say hi to somebody, I'm patting around, I'm not even sweating, <laughs> I take a shower and I go home. And I was like, I just need something that I should do every day to yeah. make it work. So what, and, and should it be daily? Why don't you just start off? Like, how would you how would you line it out? So for let us? me let me start with the first part of your question. The most important kind of exercise to do is one that you love to yeah, do. Right. So you don't really love pattering around the gym, not doing anything, right? Oh. Find a class. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Some days it's all right. yeah. Find a class. This is what I did, uh, and and. Um, I found a class that tell, was actually... Tell them about that class that you... Okay. This, well, this sounds was, like it would be something we'd want to do. It was actually a class right here at Equinox. And I went into the gym, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And it was either power boot camp or this other class called Intensati. And the power boot camp sounded too hard. So I went to the other class. I didn't know what it was. And um, how many of you have done an Intensati class? Yes. Intensati. Okay, good. So it pairs, and it was developed by an amazing fitness instructor, Patricia Moreno, and um, it pairs physical movements from kickbox and dance and yoga and martial arts with positive spoken affirmations. So which e with each move, you are yelling things out like, I believe I will succeed. I am strong now. I am inspired. And um, when I know, so I started going to this class and I noticed how much my brain improved. Yeah. I could actually write my grants better. That's, that's what really made oh, me really? sit up and take notice. And then I wanted to learn more about the field. So as a professor, I know the best way to learn a field is to teach a class. So I developed a new undergraduate class at NYU called Can Exercise Change Your Brain? But I thought, wouldn't it be fun to actually bring an exercise instructor to class to make the students exercise and then teach them about what exercise was doing to their brain? And when NYU wouldn't pay for an exercise instructor, I went to Equinox and I trained to become an oh. Intensati instructor. <laughs> and so, so I did. <laughs> It was the best decision I've ever made because it really helped my exercise regime. Yeah. And so I trained for six months, I developed the class, and I remember walking into that first day of class and I was all in my Lululemon and you know I looked a little bit different than I usually do. And I was really nervous. I, I give lots of, I was 15 years you know, giving lectures by this point, but I'd never taught an exercise class, I was very nervous. But the students, they looked scared. They did? They, they, they did not want to sweat with me. They are like, what is going on here? I knew we were supposed to exercise, but I'm exercising with you. But, you know, it completely shifted the attitude and the, um, the mood in that classroom. And I've basically never looked back. It shifted the way I teach, because getting that level of enthusiasm and motivation, um, plus all the neurotransmitters, all of the, you know, brain boosting factors, um, it was the best class that I ever taught. And uh, as you can imagine, I bring exercise into many of my classes that I teach at NYU today. Wow, that's awesome. So we should take a class we love. Yes. That, and, and how many times a week should we be doing that? Yeah, so we're still trying to figure out what the exact uh, prescription is, and it may change for men and women and how old you are. But it's going to be on the order of three times a week. Really get a good sweaty workout three times a week, however you can. If you like to work, don't, if you don't like the gym, well, you all like, like, like a gym, obviously. But if you don't, go outside, find a friend, walk, do a power walk, walk with your dog. Right. Find something that you love. 
All right. Why don't you give our, we're going to take a couple of questions. So if you guys have one that, that's kicking around in your head, think about it. And we're going to bring a mic over just real quick to ask one. But if you were going to give away some, some points, some talking points that people could go home and say, today I'm going to do ABC, what would you, what would you tell people to do? Exercise, super important. Um, but know your numbers. It's not all about weight. Know your body fat. Okay, know what your blood chemistries are. Know if, know if your blood sugar is high. Know, know your numbers, talk to your doctor, have a frank conversation. Because exercise, different types of exercise can get different types of numbers down. Okay, learn that. For me, I, I have a fitness tracker. Okay, during that exercise before, how many of you know your average heart rate during your exercise before? You don't? Know? What was it? Oh, yeah. 102, good, okay, mine was 114, okay, uh, hey, yeah, my max, I beat, I beat you by six, or no, six, uh-oh, I can't do math. So my, my max heart rate was 162, okay, know your numbers, because different numbers do different things, okay, so learn about this sort of stuff. Exercise is great, but if you don't sleep, guess what, you're not gonna reap the benefits. If you wanna take the bad protein in the brain out, that's the amyloid protein, exercise, reduces amyloid in the brain. If you wanna get the disposal system to take the trash to the curb, you have to sleep, okay? If, you don't, if you're not sleeping, you're running this vicious cycle. Um, stress, bad for the brain. Worry, rumination, causes the brain to shrink. Deep breaths, do whatever you need to do to relax. Um, eating a healthy diet, I'm, a, I'm all about the Mediterranean style diet. I like, I like your recommendations, but Mediterranean style diet probably has the highest degree of evidence. Good carbs, bad carbs, good fats, bad fats. Know the difference, learn the difference. Um, keep the brain engaged, music playing a musical instrument, learning a new language. These are the things that actually have a spillover effect to try to improve brain health over time. Um, then there's a synergy. So you can't just do one magic thing and think you're gonna prevent, cure, anything with Alzheimer's, no. It's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And the biological principle of synergy is one plus one equals three. So you exercise three to four times a week with the resistance training once a week and the cardio X a week. And wh whatever it is, whatever recipe it is for you, you have to do a little bit of everything. And get educated, get informed. There are things that everyone can do today to reduce their risk and protect their brain. We're going to take questions in just a second, but I have to tell you, I think I was telling you guys that uh, Maria Shriver came over to my house when I had my daughter, and she, I didn't know what to do between the time she finished eating and got up from her nap and before she went down for another nap. I just wasn't sure what to do. And Maria said, look, she's like us. She needs what we need. She needs to be touched and nurtured and looked at and cared for and made to feel secure. So I just turned her, and there she is right back there. I just thought you'd want a quick look. I literally, I'm sorry, I got so, I got so distracted. I was listening, I was seriously listening to your five points and my heart started pounding and I was like, oh, she's, hi, Nugget. Hi, little oh girl. God. Let me just give a quick hi, and then we're gonna. F I'm gonna take a question. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Those cheeks. Hi, little girl. Hi, Aww. 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 Bring her on up. Bring her on up. I'll hold her. What a cutie. I'm so sorry. You know when you lose it? I started totally losing it. Did you say hi? Hi, little girl. Did you say hi to the panel? Hi. Hi. Oh, oh, so I'm totally dying. Okay. Back to questions. All right, does anybody have a, there's oh. one right back there. Oh, I don't have a mic. Oh, here, I'll hold your mic. I have a question, I'm not sure. Oh. Hi, how's it going? I'm Lauren. Um, I have a question. I'm not sure if this is something that any of you have looked into, but is there any research that any of you have done that um, has found a correlation between early onset of Alzheimer's and anesthesia and being under anesthesia? Have you heard yeah, like so I, you know, um, in medicine, I guess in life sometimes, things happen in threes. And in literally like two weeks, I had three patients that came in that um, their Alzheimer's was triggered after an anesthesia event. So I guess I'm going to say two things. If you would have asked me this at last year's event, I would say, I don't know, it's, it's probably due to um, maybe they had a, some vascular problems or oxygen problems and the brain was injured and, and maybe they would have gotten Alzheimer's anyway, but Alzheimer's, the fast forward button was pressed to Alzheimer's. But actually, these three people, we, we do a lot of genetic tests, we do all sorts of things. All three of these people in those two weeks had the same gene, had a, had a specific gene that uh, is related to detoxification and methylation and that kind of thing. So hypothetically, maybe certain people are more at risk um, of the negative complications of anesthesia than others. And if the, that person was already predisposed to Alzheimer's, um, I don't think anesthesia causes Alzheimer's. Um, I think it can cause cognitive impairment, uh, maybe due to vascular or other, other issues. But I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way to press the fast forward right. button to Alzheimer's. Did, did something happen? Was there? So yeah, um, so a loved one, my grandmother, she was my best friend. Um, she 
had the early onset of Alzheimer's, and Alzheimer's runs in my family, so does dementia. Um, and she was, she really wanted to get her face done. Um, and we were really hesitant. We went to, we took her to a bunch of different doctors. We did a bunch of different um, types of research. And it was something that she really wanted to do. Um, she was, her, my grandfather, her husband had passed away for about 10 years at this point. So she was going into her 70s. And um, it was just something that she really wanted to do. And we had noticed the signs of irritability, um, you know, just forgetfulness. My mom found her in um, the parking lot of, I'm from Massapequa, Long Island. and found her in the parking lot of one of our um, shopping centers and she just couldn't find her car. Mm -hmm. So we knew something was going on. So we were just unsure of you know, whether this was the right thing to do, but it was one of those conversations that was really difficult to have as to why that we felt it was wrong. So right after she came out of her surgery, um, while she was very pleased with the results and she looked amazing, um, about a year after that, we just started to see it fast forward and fast forward. And then two years after that, um, she was forgetting to take her pills and she lived alone. And then she fell and on Valentine's Day of 2011, she, um, it was 2012, I'm sorry. She fell and she just had no idea where she was. My mom actually had to like break down the door to get to her. And after that, it was just kind of downhill from there. So just something that we've, conversations that we've had of, um, between our family and just kind of the whole genetic testing and whatnot, we are just really interested in you know, just the research behind that. So thank you, you answered You're that. You're really, really strong, amazing. by the way. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, guys. We're good on track, but we'll take it. <laughs> Is there another question? Can you lower the mic? It's back, well. I actually, if we're talking about diet, and I know so many, my, so many friends, my friends here in the gym, if we're talking about diet, for some reason they think that they supposed to take off healthy fat. For example, what I, I found for myself, if I'm on a diet, I always have omega-3, salmon, avocado, dark chocolate, a little bit bananas. It, actually, this is, helps my body to mobilize uh, fat from my body even faster. And I always feel energized. And uh, would you speak your language, professional language, uh, language, how important to not be afraid of healthy fat? Yeah. And uh, Yeah, there so are good fats, by the way. You look great. Sit down. <laughs> 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 I'm kidding. I'm totally teasing you. You look great. <laughs> you look, no, no, you look beautiful. You look beautiful. But there are the good fats and the bad fats, right? Yeah, I think Max. <laughs> I want what she's having. Um, that was hilarious. I, I think Max and I agree, and I'll, I'll pass this over to Max, but um, good fats versus bad fats know the difference. Okay, omega-3 fatty acids, that's in wild salmon, lake trout, mackerel, uh, sardines, loaded. You guys like sardines? Herring? Mm, delicious. Yeah, not for me, but sardines are really great. These are omega-3 fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory fats. It takes two and a half years to recycle the omega-3s in your brain. If you're omega-3 deficient, you have to eat this on a regular basis for several years. You then need to balance that out with the pro-inflammatory fats. Omega-6s are good for you in moderation. So the handful of almonds, okay? The, all of these fats in combination, a, a tablespoon of olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, every day will help the brain, okay? Avocados, a half an avocado, several times a week. These will not only keep you full, but will energize the brain too. Yeah, just to echo what Richard said, uh, you know, we used to think for many years uh, that fat made you fat just because they have the same name, but, um, <laughs> which is, yeah, which is kind of unfortunate, but the, but the brain loves fat, it's made of fat. Um, essentially, and fat is a vital, you know, component to cell membranes and things like that. But again, you know, fat is a continuum. At one end of the spectrum, we have trans fats, which are the absolute worst for you, recently banned by the FDA, but they're still snuck into various uh, processed foods. And then we have, you know, industrial grain and seed oils, which were, you know, a hundred years ago, non-existent in our diets, uh, save for trace amounts found in whole foods, and today they're making up a huge amount of um, you know, our caloric intake. So this is like the canola oil, the soybean oil, the corn oil. These are not, those are not healthy oils to use. Um, as Richard said earlier, you know, the Mediterranean diet, there's a, a wide body of research supporting its neuroprotective 
uh, aspects, and they use a lot of, of extra virgin olive oil. I try to use extra virgin olive oil as the singular uh, main oil in my kitchen, and there's research showing that you can consume a liter of it a week. Ew. A liter of it a week, that's a lot. That's a lot, yeah. So I don't necessarily advise doing that, but there is research that if you did choose to do that, your brain might work a little bit better, your cardiovascular uh, you know, biomarkers might be better, and you might even lose some weight. All right, there you have it. Let's all chug oil. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. Oh, do we have one more? Do we have time for one more? We have time for just one more. Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, is there any correlation with, you know, when you're saying you need to get sleep, when you're taking Tylenol PM, yeah, Advil good, PM, good is question. there any co a correlation to using that too much? Should you not, here are your options, not getting any sleep and not taking Advil PM or getting sleep and taking it, which is the better option? Well, I, I, think, I think the important thing is you have to look at your sleep hygiene. The, that Tylenol PM should only be used for the short term. But if you're having troubles with sleep, you have to really step back and look at what's going on. Is it because you're stressed and maybe you need some mindfulness meditation? Maybe there's too many things going on in your room. There's TV. Um, it's a cluttered room and it's not a restful environment and looking at sleep hygiene is more important because any of those medications are really not good for the long term um, and especially for older adults these are things that we absolutely want to avoid so things like Tylenol PM things like Benadryl a lot of the sleep agents are terrible for um, older adults and can actually affect um, their their memory and give them uh, you know, amnesia, grogginess, uh, delirium, so we want to avoid those. So really, if we're uh, looking in the holistic sense, we want to be looking at prevention and seeing what we can do um, in terms of your daily living to make sure that you're getting sleep. Some, and when people do that inventory, sometimes they find, oh, it's because I had a coffee break at 4 p.m., and I had some coffee, and then at dinner I had some Coke, which had some caffeine in it, and then I watched you know, some news that got me really upset, and so then when it's time to go to sleep at night, you're, you're not um, in a restful state to have you know, a really good night of sleep. So that's generally what I would um, mm -hmm. suggest. And, and generally in terms of back to the diet issue, I think what happens is for many people, they just get overwhelmed, they hear, uh, on the news, do this, don't do that. Um, and, and really the focus should be making small changes um, that turn the needle just a little bit on your health, health and so that you can get to a point where you have you know, a healthy diet. So let's say you drink Coke. Um, I would encourage you not to drink soda, but to get started, maybe what you wanna do is you wanna you know, start for two weeks and water it down. Um, and, and do half water and half soda. And then after two weeks, um, you water it down some more um, until you get to a point that you could cut that out of your diet and maybe add fruits, uh, juice, or something else. Or, um, you know, it, it can be really overwhelming for people to say, well, you need to eat more fruits and vegetables. So start by, you know, having two fruits during the day and you start that and you do that for two weeks and slowly adding and making mm -hmm. a change because some change is better than no change which is often what happens when people hear all these messages and it seems yeah. overwhelming. You're right, baby so just steps. just do that one little thing um, until you add all those changes and then you're Perfect. healthy. All right, one last piece of business I have to do because if y'all want to be on my show tomorrow, I got to take a selfie. <laughs> you guys, you guys want to get behind me so we can do everybody yeah. together? Okay. Okay, we'll get everybody in. Oh, we're getting, we're doing you're, it this yes, way. Yes, we're all doing it this okay. way. And you all guys, right. you want to get in too? You, right, why don't okay, you guys so. sit those chairs just so we can oh, get yeah, everybody in? Better. Okay. Can I hold the baby? I'll get. The, baby? <laughs> the baby's gone. The baby. Nobody right. knows what happens to the baby. <laughs> Ready? One. Hold on. Two. Three. Hold on. Three. 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 <laughs> you guys, what? thank you to our great panel, you guys, and thank you for coming. <laughs>